Hello there, Entre Nation. Jeff Lerner here, and I'm excited to bring you another video. In this video, we're going to be talking about content writing and comparing it with copywriting. We'll be doing a little bit of discussion about uh, which one to focus on. If you're a business owner, uh, which one do you need? Why do you need them? What are they for? And if you're actually a writer, uh, we're going to really analyze the differences between the two, maybe help you steer in the direction of which one you should focus on as a service provider. The goal of this video is to really get into the specific intent behind each style of writing and the exact methods, the mechanics even, of how each of them work, and then how to strike the right, uh, the right balance or focus between them, again, if you're a business owner or if you're a writer. And I, I was uh, telling one of my coworkers before I shot this video, I said, I'm really excited about doing this video because instead of talking to people about how to make money, we're gonna be talking to people about how to make money. Like, it's so easy to just go, well, well, you know, what, what gimmick or what link do I post or what trick do I use on, uh, on Instagram or Snapchat or some, you know, quick hack to make money. But the reality is making real money, making life-changing money comes from having great core competencies on really, really critical skills and understanding content writing and copywriting. This is the, this is the real stuff. This is the stuff that doesn't just maybe inch your business forward, but transforms everything. Ultimately tra can transform your whole life. If you understand these styles of communication, you'll find that it spills over into not even just your business, but your whole life. So again, looking at content writing versus copywriting, this can be a really exciting video. Let's dig in. So content writing and copywriting. I really look at these as two parts of the same equation. And I know that we kind of set this video up by saying it's gonna be one versus the other, but uh, as, as we're gonna see, they really complement each other. So we're gonna compare them, but we're gonna be talking about the, the different ways that ultimately they help accomplish the same objective. Like I said, two parts of the same equation. And that objective is, it's pretty simple. Get people into your funnel and sell them stuff. And a lot of people don't like that right out of the gate. They might have some resistance to this idea of like that the point of all of this, the point of all business communication and all business messaging is to like get people into your world or what we call your funnel and sell them stuff. But the reality is if you don't do that, you don't have a business. Now, you know, sales is like, it's like therapy. How many people do you know that I tried therapy and it didn't work for me? No, you tried a therapist and it didn't work for you. Therapy works. Therapists, some work for some, others work for others. Not all therapy is, uh, is the same depending on the therapist and not all sales is the same depending on the salesperson or the sales method. But at the end of the day, all businesses must have sales and people who resist sales in, as a general concept, you're actually resisting the very essence of growing a business. So if you're an entrepreneur and you have like sales resistance, that's a, a whole other video and a whole other conversation. But for purposes of this video, I'm gonna assume that you are in business to build a business and to not go out of business and therefore you like sales. And we're gonna talk about how content writing and copywriting both contribute to that goal. So let's start by talking about content writing. Uh, first of all, what's the goal of content. Uh, obviously we said that the, the overarching goal of all of it is to get people into your funnel and sell stuff, but e each of these different pieces of that equation have different goals. So the goal of content writing is to create engagement, to create trust, to build goodwill, and ultimately what we would call to warm people up. And it, and it basically comes down to this. It's, there's one statistic that helps you probably more than anything else understand the difference between content writing and copywriting. And that statistic is this, they have surveyed people and they say, do you, do you know this brand? Do you like this brand? Do you trust this brand? Do you relate to this brand? Do you resist this brand? Do you resent this brand? Do you hate this brand? Do you blank this brand? And they have people fill out these surveys and then they parse all the data and organize all the data. And then finally they say, do you 
per, do you, are you a customer of this brand? Have you bought from this brand? And they have found that there are three of those statements that directly correlate to the last question of, do you buy from this brand or are you a customer? And it's, and it's this, know, like, and trust. If people rate a brand as known, liked, and trusted, they were seven times more likely to have purchased from that brand or that business, right? So you can look at it as simply saying, the goal of my content is to get myself known or get my business known, get my business liked, and get my business trusted. Well, so all the things that would go into that, uh, that that's gonna be your content. Now, to get my business money is not the goal of content. Again, known, liked, and trusted. And again, we said that means engagement, that means building goodwill, goodwill, giving a lot of value, serving people, getting to know people, making people feel like there's a conversation happening, not just a one-way talking at, and ultimately warming people up to wanna learn more about what you have to offer. Make sense? And I'm gonna come back to that question I just asked you, make sense, right? Because obviously this is a one-way video, you can't necessarily tell me, you can't respond to me that it makes sense, but we're gonna circle back to why I said it. It's a, Interesting little nuance there. And you definitely can leave me a comment below and let me know if this makes sense. Uh, and I'd love for you to do that. But I, I said that on purpose and I wanna, I wanna circle back to it uh, later in this video. So now that we've articulated the goals of content writing, I want to uh, discuss the method. How exactly do you do it? Uh, first of all, there's what we call your mix. So if you take all your content, which uh, maybe we should stop and define content. I think most people kind of intrinsically know what their content platforms are, but it's basically gonna be anything that is, you know, like I said, building up, building conversation, building engagement, building relationship, building rapport, but not explicitly selling. So for most businesses in terms of their online, it's gonna be their social media, uh, maybe blog type content, and certainly YouTube videos, for example. This is a great example of content marketing. and. Your content that you put out through those platforms, you really wanna have it be a mix of, and I, I put these in uh, the order of importance, I believe, education, entertainment, and enticement. And I put those in, in order um, because I think that's the right order for a business that ultimately has a sales objective. Now, there are some people, uh, some content creators, uh, YouTube comes to mind, for example, who definitely put entertainment first. Entertainment. And then, frankly, they may never even go for, for education or enticement. And those are some of the best content creators that are just out there to entertain. But I wouldn't say they're necessarily the best marketers. And, you know, I, there's actually a, a big industry of, of people who go to YouTube content creators who have millions and millions of subscribers, let's say, and they have highly entertaining content. But the reality is they don't actually have a very good business. A lot of people, I think, are, are a little bit misguided on how your social presence correlates to your business objectives. Um, there are a lot of people who have really, really big audiences and provide a lot of entertainment-based content, but their audience isn't actually that worth that much from a business perspective because they, they don't actually have a funnel. They don't have a way to move people along sequentially towards a business decision. And ultimately, they may not have a, a real product or service orientation to begin with to, to sell in the first place. Um, so I really find that by putting education ahead of entertainment, you start to build that trust and authority that ultimately leads people to the place of maybe wanting to do business as opposed to just wanting to hang out. There's people on YouTube that I love to quote hang out with. I like watching their stuff because it's fun, but I'm not viewing them through the lens of, hey, this person has something to offer me that can advance my life or that can help me meet a currently unmet goal or need or desire that I'd be willing to trade some money for, right? So that, that to me is a very specific sequence. Education, then entertainment, then enticement. And, and as far as entertainment and enticement, that's an important order of events because uh, if you educate, people learn, they think, but they don't necessarily feel. So if you educate and then entice, entice is like, it's pre-selling, right? It's showing or explaining something that sounds enticing, it sounds intriguing to people, they kind of lean in, they want to know more, but it's not actually asking for the sale, it's not actually trying to close a deal, it's just sort of hinting or almost teasing. And it's, it, it comes from understanding who, who you're talking to and what it is that they actually want, and you kind of can hint at it. But if you, if you go from education right to enticement, you haven't actually engaged them. Remember, it's knowing, liking, and trusting. Through education, they might know you, 
they might trust you. They might think you're super smart and you have so much to offer, but they haven't actually, they don't actually like you yet. That's why entertainment is, is so important. Um, so education, then entertainment, and then enticement. And then, as you've probably guessed, ultimately we get into more of the realm of copywriting because from there they can go into your funnel and you can actually start to develop a relationship that can lead towards a sale. But uh, before we get into copywriting, let's talk a little bit more about content and what are some of the defining elements of content and how you do it. First of all, the, the best way to think of your content writing, your content marketing in general, is that you're building a story through non-chronological snippets over time. Have you ever seen one of those movies that's like got like flashbacks of memory and ultimately you're kind of watching and you're like piecing together all the elements of the story and by the end of the movie it all comes clear and there's some sort of dramatic format that, that all emerges as you fill in the blanks of the story, right? But it's not just like this happened and then follow along. It's not chronological, right? Uh, I'm thinking of like a movie called Memento. It's just one movie that comes to mind. It's very non-chronological and it's through these little vignettes that ultimately piece together to form the story. The reason this is so important from a marketing perspective and to understand that your content game is not a chronological sequence. And this is why it's important to do more than just say every day post about what happened to you that day where it's like, oh, you know, 200 days in a row, I got to see what happened in this person's life for 200 days. That doesn't actually do the same thing as, you know, reflections, sign up for time hop and post a picture from five years ago and talk about what you learned on that day and then maybe show what you did today and then maybe talk a little bit about your goal for the future and then maybe talk about when you were a kid and this non-chronological kind of bouncing around. Here's why that's so important. That's actually how we make friends. Think about it. Getting to know, think about your best friend and how you got to know your best friend. Maybe the first time you met, there were a couple interactions, but probably when you started to turn the corner into a deeper friendship is maybe when you sat down and they shared something with you about their past. And then you had maybe a few more interactions and then maybe they shared something with you about their plans for the future. And then maybe you had a few more interactions, kind of the day-to-day -day stuff. Maybe you went to lunch and we caught a movie and then something about that movie made them think of, hey, I gotta tell you a story, man. I was on this date one time, we went to the movies and this happened, they tell a funny story from two years ago. And then maybe they tell you about something from when they were a kid and the same non-chronological snippets over time, that's actually how we build our roadmap in our friend relationships. The people who we know, like, and trust the most in our life, the template for how we build those relationships is through non chronological snippets of life experience shared over time. So if you want to build that same type of rapport with your audience, you should approach it the same way. You should make friends with them, right? Really let that sink in. Like that, people are like, what do, I, what do I post? Say, I don't know, what would you share with your friend, right? And you use lots of stories and just like any good friend, you're asking them to share back with you. So what do you think, right? Remember when earlier when I said makes sense? That was one decent example. And in, in every one of my YouTube videos, I'm gonna ask for comments. Let me know what you think. This is content marketing. I'm not, I'm not gonna try to hide that. I'm doing content marketing. I run a digital marketing-based business. I want to connect with and make friends with the whole world so that for those who I can help, you might find value in the relationship and, and wanna do some business with me, right? So calls for reciprocal engagement. Hey, let me know, share a story, share a comment, share a thought. Like and subscribe, let's do this again, right? The key, uh, I guess one, one more so defining element with this concept is, um, and it's really permission. Your content marketing gives you permission to be creative. A lot of people get really boxed in. They kind of develop this tunnel approach to content marketing. Like I gotta do it every day and it's rigid and it's firm and I gotta talk about this and I gotta talk about this and I gotta talk about this. Frankly, to the extent that your content is kind of whimsical, it's very often gonna be the best. Now, it needs to be whimsical, but intentional. But it's definitely non-linear, and it's non-directive. You're not telling people what to do through your content. That's really, really key. Nobody likes friends who are always bossing them around and telling them what to do, right? Now, remember I said, uh, I said, I asked that question, makes sense? So hey, this is a bonus tip. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna explain what I mean. This is a really, really cool and valuable thing that you can do in your content marketing that actually sets up what you wanna do in your copywriting, which is, and you may have heard this term in sales, called trial closing. So trial closing is a technique where you're basically trying to what we call induce a yes state. 
You wanna get people saying yes to you a lot, right? All through the sales conversation. So can you see how if people say yes to you early in the conversation, they're more likely to say yes to you later in the conversation. You just said yes, or you, you nodded your head, right? You, that made sense, what I said. So I'm helping induce a yes state. Makes sense? There, I did it again, just like I did earlier, right? So can you see how your content marketing is actually an opportunity to do a lot of this, what we call trial closing, before you're even actually doing the actual closing of trying to sell anything, right? Because in your content marketing, if you're going for engagement anyways, if you're going for a reciprocal sharing, there's no reason you can't frame your calls for engagement as opportunities for people to say yes, right? So if you see what I mean, I would love if you would share in the comments below this video an example or maybe something that comes to mind for you as I'm saying this. Can you do that for me? See, everything I'm asking, everything I'm saying is stuff that induces a yes response, an open yes response where it's yes and. Yes, Jeff, that makes sense. And let me share just like you asked me to. So this is actually trial closing, but it's trial closing packaged inside of content we're not even into selling anything, right? And certainly my plan is that if a million people or 10 million people enter my world, my sphere of my content and the, the wide mouth of my funnel that some people are gonna trickle down and maybe wanna do some business together, but I, I'm not going for that. Remember, it's enticement. I'm sort of hinting at this possibility. My whole, I mean, my channel is called Jeff Lerner Millionaire Secrets, right? Like this guy, just Jeff guy, he knows something. He knows something about how to produce uh, revenue and create success and abundance in his life. Well, it's, it's enticing, right? It's intriguing, but it's not hard. It's not, an, it's not directive. It's, I'm not bossing you around unless you have to buy my thing, right? You know? So hopefully you're seeing that, that what I'm trying to do is, is demonstrate good content marketing that's, like I said, it's creative, but it's still intentional. And the bottom line is this, content is required. If you don't wanna do it, hire someone else to do it. And here's what I'll tell you if you're a writer going, well, should I get into content creation or should I be a copywriter? Because a lot of times you hear about copywriting like it's this you know, magical power and if you get good at copywriting, you can name your price and you can get any gig you want and be incredibly valued in the market. And that is all true. But there's a lot more awareness in the business marketplace of people saying, I know I need content than people saying, I know I need copy. So even though copywriting, you could argue, is the most valuable thing because it's gonna close the sales, which we're gonna talk about here in a minute. Remember, value's in the eye of the beholder. And so content is the more in-demand thing. So if you have a good strategy and skill for, for good content writing and good content creation, one could argue that you're just as valuable, if not even more valuable in some ways, than great copywriters. So, you know, for you as a writer, that's the power, is to understand that every single business not only needs good content, but they actually, most of them know they need good content. And if you're a business owner, hopefully this isn't the first you're hearing about this, you have to have good content marketing. And if you're not willing to do it yourself, you need to hire someone to do it. Okay, so now let's talk about the other piece of the equation, copywriting, right? So what is the objective of copywriting? It's, it's taking what happened in our content writing and because we've warmed people up, because we're now known, we're now liked, we're now trusted. When, when you trust someone, they don't have to be as delicate about giving you advice. When you trust someone and they say, hey, I see that you're struggling with this, I see that your, your elbow is inflamed and maybe you've got, you know, I don't know, you played too much tennis or something, I tried this this remedy, and when I had tennis elbow back in the day, and man, it did wonders for me, you should check it out, right? Like you'll hear that from someone who you know, like, and trust, but you don't wanna hear that from some guy on the street, right? So once your content marketing has warmed people up, you've, you've effectively earned the right to start to be a little more instructive, and that's where it it's sort of evolves into copywriting, right? So you're directing behavior. I guess to be very pragmatic, the goal of your copywriting is like, well, what, what am I really trying to do here? You're trying to generate sales. You're trying to generate revenue. And, and in the grand scheme of a business model, your copy should really be focused on two things, which are really two sides of that same revenue coin. One is, and this is, this is kind of just my belief, but it, it works really, really well, because in business, uh, as they say, um, you, you know, if you read like, 
uh, you know, Vern Harnish's stuff like Rockefeller Habits and Scaling Up, one of the things he talks a lot about is how a lot of people undervalue cash flow. They overly focus on either top line revenue or profits, but cash flow, the rate at which you receive your cash and the liquidity and the speed, the velocity with which it comes in, ultimately has as much or even sometimes more to do with the, the ability to grow a business than even profitability. It's not how much you make, it's when you make first and then how much you're making. So good copy should be oriented with a cash flow perspective to say, I'm not just trying to generate sales, I'm trying to generate enough sales now that it can feed the beast of trying to grow my business. So I have a belief that good copywriting should generate enough revenue to at least cover my advertising costs. Because if I'm covering my advertising costs, it means I can keep running ads without having to wait. If I can keep running ads without having to wait for sales to back out into profits over the long term, then I can grow my business exponentially faster than if there's any sort of a delay or a lag, right? So I think good copy, your, your, your baseline metric is what we, in industry parlance or internet marketing parlance, we call it one ROAS, one return on ad spend, one, one X return on ad spend. If I spend $100 on ads, my copy should be effective enough to generate me back $100 in pretty quick sales so that I can keep that cycle going. Because frankly, internet-based advertising platforms, they don't bill you monthly. They bill you every few hundred dollars in ad spend. They don't want to run up a bill of $20,000 and hope that you pay it. They're, they're charging you every few hundred bucks, right? So you, you put out $500, you want to make back $500 pretty quickly and be able to cycle that cash flow. And again, I believe that your copy has everything to do with that. But there's a nuance to it, which is that you're also, you don't want to be so aggressive or so hard hitting with your copy that you create resistance or frustration or buyer's remorse or certainly anything, any false promises or anything that's going to lead to, to doubts further on. Because the other thing that's, I think it just as important with your copy is that you're making sure you set up maximum lifetime customer value or what we call LTV lifetime value. If your copy is doing its job, then it is both generating one times ROAS at the, at the point of delivery. So your copy is moving people through the funnel and getting them quickly to a point of sale where you're at least recouping your ad cost. And you're doing so in a way that sets up a positive experience, a positive attitude about doing potentially future business with the company, whether it's repeat business, whether it's ascending through a, a product staircase model, whether it's uh, potentially taking some upgrades, what, whatever the model is, in a way so that your copy has set the right expectations that lead to the maximum lifetime value in the long term. So a lot of people don't realize your copy is one of the most powerful levers you can pull in your business because it is almost single-handedly responsible for both generating the upfront cash necessary to be able to scale quickly, but also positioning and setting the right expectations that it will allow you to scale maximally and get maximum value out of your organization in the long term. The bottom line is this, nothing will impact both the long-term profitability, the short-term scalability, and the ultimate customer satisfaction because it's what sets expectations in your business than your copy. Okay, so now that we've set the tone and the intention for good copywriting, let's talk about how you actually do it. First of all, every piece of copywriting should have one goal. This is something really, really important to understand. A lot of people try to you know, eat the elephant multiple bites at a time and that's not what good copywriting is supposed to do. Every piece of copy should have one goal and, and within each piece of copy, in order to evaluate it as a piece of copy, there are a few questions that you should ask, which we'll talk about. But the, the first and foremost question should be, is it extremely clear what one thing this piece of copy is directing a person to do or, or ideally inspiring a person to do? If so, it's good copy. Uh, the, the things that would be where you've kind of crossed over into the copywriting realm and out of the content realm, we mentioned content is like your social media, your, your video marketing, your, like your YouTube channel, for example, your blog, even some elements of your website. But where you've moved into copy would be like certainly anything that you're paying to deploy. You don't want to spend money except in a very few cases where you have a very demonstrable return on investment for growing your profile as a whole, like boosting content videos, for example, on like a, a Facebook or a YouTube. But in general, you don't, if you're spending money to drive eyeballs to something, that's copy. That needs to be copy focused. So like an ad, right? You, you run an ad, you pay $100 a day for people to see this ad, that's copy. And it's gotta, it's gotta produce, it's gotta 
be trackable, it's got to be intentional, and it's got to be singular in its objective. The ad is intended to get people to do what? To click a thing and go to a page. That's all the ad is meant to do. And then again, the only other consideration with copy is not setting a, a, a misaligned expectation that's going to be out of sync with anything that comes subsequently. Remember, number one goal of copy is to lead towards that one times ROAS that allows you to scale. But the, sh the close second goal is to set proper expectations that ultimately lead to the best long-term value, lifetime value for your customers. And, and sort of the other side of lifetime value is customer satisfaction, right? So your ad is a piece of copy that should singularly move people to take an action that ultimately gets them into your world. Now, once they're in your world, that would be something like, let's say, a landing page. And for example, I've got links below this, this YouTube video that it could be something that takes you to my Facebook group, for example, which is in my world where the line, you know, Facebook group is still going to, you're going to see a lot of content marketing. And that, frankly, going from YouTube to Facebook, that would be an example of content linking to content. But once you're in my group, you're in a little more controlled environment where the content can kind of start to morph into copy that moves you more intentionally directly into a funnel. But also you're on my YouTube channel, which is also a fairly controlled environment. And this, this idea of control, I don't, I don't want to veer into a, a other territory here, but this idea of how controlled the environment is helps you govern to some degree whether you should be using content or copy type thinking. YouTube, I would say, is a medium controlled environment because even though my channel is my videos, I control a lot of what's served up and certainly I control what's in the video. YouTube... Uh, is still going to show you related videos and other other ads from other or not a, well some ads and some other content from other people so it's not a 100% controlled environment so I'm kind of like straddling the line here but some of the links below are going to move you right to a funnel one will take you to a, a landing page which is going to ask for an email address to move forward and that's an example a landing page is a is a place where you are fully transitioned into copywriting. So on a landing page, even every single element of the landing page, there's a headline, potentially there's a subheadline, potentially sometimes there's a super headline above the headline. There might be some body copy. There might be a call to action. There might be a button that has a few words on it, like get instant access or submit your form or click here for the next step or download your ebook or whatever the call to action is. But even literally something as simple as changing out the words on the button can have a huge impact on the effectiveness of that page from moving people to the one singular next step, which is going to the next page, which had one singular condition in that case, which was putting in their email address, right? So this concept of singularity and linear thinking in directing user behavior is one of the massive differences between copy and content writing. The simple fact that I'm shooting a video right now and that below this video, there are multiple links and multiple options. That should be a pretty good indicator. This is content, not copy. Because content, I'm fine saying, you know, just sharing, building rapport, building trust, giving you options, saying, hey, choose your, it's like a choose your own ending type of book. But once you're in a funnel and I'm working with copy, I'm only ever giving you one place to go, one next step all the time, right? So if you have an ad that links to a landing page or even content that links to a landing page, now they're in the world of copy. From your landing page, you're typically gonna have them go directly to some kind of a sales page. Maybe it's a long letter, maybe it's a video slideshow, maybe it's a webinar, a, a pre-recorded webinar, maybe it's a registration for a live webinar, whatever it is, there's always one singular objective. Every single word is meticulously crafted, and we'll talk about how you craft it to direct people to the next step. And then at this point, for lack of a better way to say it, the gloves are kind of off. They're in the sales process. Everybody kind of knows what's happening. And so you want to be artful about it, but essentially you're always moving forward to the next thing. So whether it's a checkout page with a shopping cart, whether it's even like say a phone script, maybe you, you know, people ask, request a phone call to get more information. Maybe they click a link to go into a messenger bot and you're chatting with them in Facebook. Anytime the the conversation evolves from being one to many into one to one, which would include like if you're sending out an email to your list, even though that feels like a, a broadcast mechanism, that's still one to one uh, communication through your writing. You've basic, well, actually I say that email could probably, you could probably argue kind of like a YouTube channel sort of can be approached as content or can be approached as copy. And typically you just want to know which one you're doing at any given time. But generally I approach email as copy because by the time they're on my email list, they're in my funnel, they're in my world and I'm sharing. And I typically, every email has one, one primary objective. So anyway, at this point, you're now in the world of copy. So let's talk about what makes good copy. What is it that gets people engaged enough, assuming you've, you've developed knowing, liking, and trusting through your content efforts. What is it that gets people engaged enough to actually 
want to take the next step, whatever the next step is. It basically comes down to two things. And one of them is something I'm actually going to be talking about in the next video I release after this one, uh, which is about understanding who you're talking to and what it is that they want. Uh, and, and that we'll just touch on lightly here. And I'll say, you got to understand who you're talking to and have a very clear definition in your mind of who you're talking to and a very clear conclusion about what it is that they want and how you can help. Um, but again, I'm shooting a whole other video to talk about that that'll be published probably within a week of this video. But the other thing is simplicity and clarity of messaging. I think a lot of people think that because copy seems like this big complex thing, this, you know, most people think about, think about your life. I'll think about my life. Certainly before I understood the power of direct response copywriting and the ability to get people to do a thing. Most of us live a life generally feeling like we don't have the control that we would want. Look at the world. Every angry person in the world, every frustrated person in the world, every impatient person in the world, every unfulfilled person in the world is essentially suffering from a feeling that they can't get people to do what they want, right? So there's a massive condition of feeling like people aren't doing what we, what we think they should do, right? Or what we want them to do. Essentially, what becoming a good copywriter, you start to solve that problem in your life. That's why I said it spills over into a lot more than just your business. But one of the things that you really, really start to understand is the power of simple messaging. When you read great copywriting, it is so easy to read. That's why it has this like lilting, hypnotic quality because there's nothing in it that makes you stop and like have to think too hard. It's not, great copy is the opposite of those books that they had you read in college where you like had to read with a dictionary and you were, you, you, you dreaded doing it. Great copy is like fun to read. And when you get good at it, it's fun to write. And they've done, uh, they've done studies actually on copywriting and found that the optimal writing level for good sales and marketing copy is third grade. Like if you're writing sixth grade level marketing copy, you're actually being too sophisticated. Now, if you're writing kindergarten and you got all kinds of misspellings and you capitalize the wrong letters and it's just weird, um, that's not good either. But that third grade, and think about third grade. Third grade is when you kind of started to like be able to write and it sounded normal. It sounded like something that people would reasonably say, but there was almost no sophistication to it, right? Um, and, and you have to understand, business is about making it easy for people to do business with you. That's the key to sales. You have to make it easy so that it just feels like this. the natural next step is to do business with you, right? Well, the first step in being easy to do business with is being like almost childishly easy, literally, to understand. And again, they've done tests on this. This isn't just a theory. And the best way I think to do this is I mean, think about Nike. Just do it. Just do it. Like it's not, that's not complex copy. It's actually difficult to be that simple in some cases. You know, most, I forget who said a great copywriter said this and I don't remember who it was, but he said, if I'd had more time, I would have written less. So uh, I always think Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde said, you know, don't use big words because they mean so little. And that's really it. That's honestly the best starting point I can, I can say for writing great copy. I'm actually gonna give you some more resources toward writing great copy. But uh, Gary Halbert, who's a great copywriter, he basically taught his students, he said, just go find good advertising, good marketing, things that resonate with you, and literally write it, speak it out loud and write it down. Speak it out loud and write it down. I mean, if you wanna learn to talk like a third grader, I don't know, I guess you could go uh, play reruns of, of Nickelodeon shows on TV and try to talk like a third grader, but it's probably better to go to copywriters who are very, very smart adults who have learned to write in a strategic way like a third grader to achieve a very specific, very sophisticated result and read what they wrote and write down what they wrote by freehand. He says, don't even, well, he didn't say this, but his instruction was to write it with a pen, not to type it. Gary Halbert was before computers were popular. But um, anyway, so that, you know, hopefully I'm inspiring you that like anyone can learn good copy. Good copywriting isn't actually so much about learning to write great copy. It's about unlearning how to do all this other stuff that we think might help when really it hurts. Okay, so uh, hopefully that's uh, giving you some good perspective on the distinction between content writing and copywriting and, and how they fit together. As far as one versus the other, it's probably obvious at this point, I believe firmly that you need both and you need both for a very probably obvious reason, which is sales is a numbers game. Sales, you need a lot of prospects 
and you need to be effectively to convert some of those prospects into customers. And if you don't have a lot of prospects and you don't have the ability to convert some of them into customers, then neither one by itself is gonna be sufficient. And so you use content to fill your pipeline, to fill up the wide mouth of your funnel. And then you use copywriting to convert the best people within that cluster into becoming customers. And if you're not clear on when to use content and when to use copy, what will happen is you'll undermine both efforts because you'll, you'll be using content thinking when you should be using copy and it won't convert. These are people that are friends with everyone but can't run a business. You probably know people like that, these sanguine personality types that are like everybody loves but they, they could just, you, know, you, you end up telling stories about, man, my uncle, he could talk to anyone. He never met a stranger. Everybody loved him but he failed 40 times at business. He could just never get anything off the ground, right? That's a guy that was probably really, really good at content strategy but sucked at copy. And then on the flip side, you have people that are like, man, that guy's so intense. He, I always feel like he's trying to sell me something, right? Well, that guy's good at copy. He might, well, he might be good at copywriting, although if he feels like he's trying to sell you, he's probably not that good at that either, but he definitely sucks at content. He's not, he's not developing knowing, liking, and trusting in the market, right? You've got to have both. You have to fill your pipeline, but then you have to know when to close the deal, right? It's like knowing when to kiss the girl. Like if you've been, if you go on too many dates and you never kiss the girls, like you end up in the friend zone, right? <laughs> That's actually like kind of how business is. Now, as, so as a business owner, again, you, you really, really need both. Now, if you're a, a freelancer or a writer, I, I recommend that you do specialize in one or the other. Trying to be the jack of both trades, you'll end up, you won't be able to charge or command the rate that comes with a specialization in one or the other. So I really recommend you kind of look at your personality and say, hey, am, am I more of a, you know, frankly, a gregarious socializer, uh, planner, somebody that likes to have a lot of meetings? Think about it this way, copywriters, typically work on more, because copywriting is so focused on the singular objective, a lot of times copywriters have a more singular focused relationships with their clients. So if you want to have a client, a meeting with a client where you sit down for a couple days, do a deep dive, get really, really clear on what they want, and then you get to go disappear for a month and produce it, that's, that's more of a copywriting model. If you want to have to meet over and over and check in and always be asking for photographs and asking for updates and having more of a social relationship with your clients, that's more of a content creator, a content writer. Um, so it's really about knowing your personality as a service provider and figuring out which one's gonna be the best fit for you. So that's it, that's content writing and copywriting, hopefully served up to you in a way that gives you a lot of value, packaged mostly as a presentation of content. Hopefully this doesn't come off too copy-esque. That's, that's not the intent, I'm not there yet, right? But speaking of such things, I would love it if you would like this video, if you've gotten value, if you would subscribe to the channel, if you'd like to get more value, and please, please do comment. Uh, let me know your thoughts on this. Let me know, A, if you, you know, how you've used these various aspects in the market, if you're confused about either of them, and maybe even some examples of where you've seen them used well or people you've seen, them, uh, seen do them well just out there. I'm always, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to teach, but I also really, really appreciate the opportunity to learn. Now, I do want to mention actually one really, really cool tool. I, I said earlier I was going to give you some resources in the realm of copy. I know that copywriting can be this kind of intimidating concept, and for the majority of my career, I've always had this attitude of like, well, you just got to learn it. You just got to do it. And it's only recently that I've accepted that we live in a world now that is so evolved that there's actually a tool that might potentially help people bypass at least some of the hard, slow learning curve aspects of copywriting. And I actually learned about this from a friend of mine whose name is John Benson, who's one of the great original online copywriters uh, from the last 15 years at the time I'm shooting this video. He actually in invented the video sales letter and he has a piece of software that he developed called copypro.ai. And I'll, I'll drop a link to it in the, uh, in the description below, but copypro actually allows you to, it uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to actually be able to create copy based on filling in some blanks. It's like the most sophisticated Mad Lib you can imagine and then it pulls templates from some of the great copywriters of all time. And anyway, it's, it's a beautiful piece of software. You can check that out if, if you're interested in this copywriting thing, but you're thinking, man, I don't, I don't know if I have 10 years to master it. Well, copypro.ai can be a, a big jump ahead for you. Uh, and then finally, I'll invite you to join my Facebook group. Entrenation is the name of the group on Facebook. Or if you already know, that you want to, you know, frankly, transition into copy and, and see more of my stuff in a way that's 
linear and directive and gonna try to lead you towards a, a specific goal. And if, you're, if your goal is to be an entrepreneur and be successful doing some of the same things that I do, I have a great course called The Entre Blueprint and I'll drop a link for that below as well. So that's it. That's what I got for you today and I appreciate your time. I'll see you hopefully on the next video. Take care.